July 3, 1941. Barely 10 days after the largest military operation in history began, General Holder wrote in his diary that it was no exaggeration to say that the Red Army had already been largely defeated, and that it was to be expected for the Soviet Union to surrender in the next few days. However, a month later on August 11, Holder, whose position was Chief of Staff of the High Command of the German Army, stated the following. Regarding the general situation, it is increasingly clear that we have underestimated the Russian Colossus. At the beginning of the war we had calculated that the Red Army had a total of about 200 divisions. We have now identified more than 360. These divisions are not armed and equipped in a similar way to ours, and tactically they are very poorly led. But in any case, those divisions are there and when we destroy a dozen of them, another 12 instantly appear in their place. The Soviets are favored by the time factor, since they are close to their own centers of power and production, while we are getting further and further away from ours. As we see, the difference between one message and another is abysmal. The question we have to ask ourselves is, what happened during that month of July 1941? Well, that is exactly what we are going to see next. On June 22, 1941, the German Center Army Group began its advance towards Moscow, its capture being the most important objective of Operation Barbarossa. The first days of the offensives were filled with great victories, including the capture of Minsk in the first days of July, inflicting more than 300,000 casualties on the Red Army. After this, the next step towards Moscow, passed through the city of Smolensko, which was another central axis of communications. In addition, once this city was taken, the German army would already be located some 350 kilometers from Moscow, thus being within reach of the next operation. As we have seen in Halder's first entry, after having heavily defeated the hundreds of Soviet divisions near the border, the Germans hoped that from now on this advance would be less costly. However, as we are going to see, this was not the case. The German strategy to take Smolensk was to carry out a pincer attack on the city, in which Hermann Hoth's 3rd Panzer Army would advance from the north, and Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army would advance from the south. Both armies were made up of three panzer and three motorized divisions, Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army being slightly superior to Hoth's. In addition to these German attack formations, we must add more than a dozen infantry divisions. In total, some 400,000 men with 1,000 tanks. On the other hand we have the Red Army, which despite having already suffered millions of casualties, was reorganizing at full speed, and was sending everything it had into combat. In total, Timoshenko was able to fight with 13 armies, including those that had been retreating from Minsk, and those that came as reinforcements from the rear. Among all of them, there were about 550,000 soldiers with 1,500 tanks. The battle began on July 10 with a simultaneous attack by the 2nd and 3rd Panzer Armies. 3rd Panzer Army charged northeast to reach north of Smolensko, and Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army charged east to be south of the city. Both attacks managed to break through at full speed, easily overcoming the weak Soviet defenses. This was due to the fact that most of the armies that Timoshenko was going to count on were still arriving in the area, and the units that withstood the German onslaught were those that were already crushed after hard fighting. This attack was made almost exclusively with the Panzer divisions, since most of the infantry divisions had not yet arrived. The truth was that during the previous weeks, the advance of the Panzers had been so rapid that the infantry had not been able to keep up on foot, and had fallen far behind. Heinrichi himself, who years later was in charge of defending the Silo Hills, also participated in this battle, and on July 8 he noted the following. Now we are very behind with respect to the motorized divisions. We march between 30 and 35 kilometers a day, and although the horses have a lot of difficulty making their way on the sandy roads, we must continue on. Later on July 11, with the Battle of Smolensko in full swing, Heinrichi wrote the following again. Yesterday, one regiment marched 54 kilometers on foot, and another 47. Doing it once is possible, but doing it after having made numerous marches of between 30 and 40 kilometers is a tremendous thing. To achieve this, no one sleeps at night. 
They set out at 2 or 3 in the morning, and continue walking until it gets dark again at 10. Thus, and as we can see, both the German infantry and the Soviet reinforcements arrived in the vicinity of Smolensko once the attack had already begun. This first attack by the panzers had resulted in two penetrations to the east and northeast, leaving four Soviet armies in a large salient west of Smolensk. Further south, the Germans also launched another attack that ended up pinning two Soviet armies near Mogilev. Once the gap was open, the panzer divisions had to continue advancing, while the infantry that was still arriving on the battlefield established itself on the perimeters of the encirclements. However, their arrival was delayed for a few days, and this meant that the panzers could not advance as fast as they wanted. In any case, on the 12th and 13th the offensives resumed, and the city of Smolensko was practically surrounded, having only a small corridor in the northeast. This moment was also taken advantage of by the Soviet reinforcements, which began to arrive in the area and established themselves on the banks of the Vop River in the north, and further down in the southwest of Yelnia. In total, about five large Soviet armies were established east of Smolensko, with about 50,000 soldiers each. During the days of July 15 and 16, the situation was quite chaotic on the German front, where there were a multitude of units fighting in isolation and with very little cohesion. Thus, and while the infantry was arriving little by little, the panzer and motorized divisions continued to attack the Soviets, hoping to finish breaking their defenses and their will to continue resisting. This attack was directed in the north against the banks of the Vop River, and in the south of Smolensko it was directed against the city itself, and against Rokosovsky's army that was located to the east of the city. This German attack managed to make some progress, but it had less and less momentum, and Smolensk was still not completely surrounded. In addition, the Soviet resistance in the east of Smolensk was increasing. Between the 16th and 19th, most of the German infantry divisions finally began to reach the outskirts of the city, and after dealing with two isolated Soviet armies southwest of Smolensk, began to shore up the front line. This moment coincided with a strong Soviet counterattack, which was carried out by all the armies that had concentrated in the east of the Vop River. This attack could be contained by the Germans, and contributed to the formation of a solid front line in the vicinity of Smolensk in the shape of a capital S. While these combats were taking place, on July 16, Hitler issued Directive 31, this being one of the most important of the entire war. It stated that after taking Smolensk, Hoth's 3rd Panzer Army had to turn north to support the capture of Leningrad, and Guderian's 2nd Panzer Army had to go south to participate in the future Great Battle of Kiev. These were undoubtedly very tense moments for Guderian, Hoth, and von Bach, who did not want to deviate from their course towards Moscow. In any case, the battle for Smolensk continued on the 20th, 21st and 22nd, with a series of Soviet counterattacks along the entire front line, without achieving any break. It should be noted that most of these troops had been mobilized at full speed, and had very little combat value. The Germans for their part continued to press on during the following days, until by July 27 they were finally able to completely encircle Smolensk, and they also continued advancing eastward, also capturing the city of Yelnia. After a few attempts by Rokosovsky to rescue the encircled troops, it all ended on August 5, when the Soviet garrison in Smolensk surrendered. The losses in this battle were very high for both sides, the Red Army suffering close to 450,000 casualties between dead, wounded and prisoners, while the German side had about 100,000. However, the heavy fighting in this sector was far from over, and soon the terrible battle of Yelnia would begin, with even worse results. Although it will be a battle that we will see soon, let's now analyze the consequences of this tough battle for Smolensk. First of all, it made clear to the Germans the great capacity that the Red Army had to recover from all its losses, and to return to launch great counterattacks. This made it clear that it was difficult to produce that great quick and resounding victory in the Soviet Union. On the other hand, it was at this moment that the decision was made not to continue advancing towards Moscow, and to divide the units of Army Group Center, to participate in operations that had the objective of capturing hundreds of thousands of soldiers. Soviets, which ultimately would not be enough to cause the collapse of the Red Army. 
So, and before the end of the program, we want to highlight another phrase from Heinrichi dated August 3rd, this being the moment of the end of this battle. In it we are going to see how the tone begins to be more desperate, and victory looks further and further away. When enemy units are destroyed, the Soviets send new troops to the front and attack again. How the Russians get it is beyond my knowledge. In the meantime, we barely received a replacement. Sometimes we wonder what winter has in store for us. We will most certainly have to remain here in Russia. So we will have to endure a positional war along a huge front. What a wonderful prospect. And what do you think? Do you consider this battle one of the turning points of Operation Barbarossa? Do you think they should have continued advancing towards Moscow? Soon we will continue this series with the huge Battle of Yelnia. If you want to analyze this operation in greater depth, I leave you in the description the program that we have with Carlos Caballero Jurado about this German attack on the Soviet Union. Thank you all so much for being part of this community, especially the sponsors who make this possible. Subscribe and share this program if you liked it, and see you as always every Thursday and Sunday, see you soon.